James chapter 1 in your Bibles, please. James chapter number 1. The book of James is designed to teach us how faith works. And indeed, when we come to verse number 12 through verse number 16, a subject is broached that is uh, relevant to every one of us in this room this morning, certainly to me. And uh, the subject is endurance and uh, enduring temptation, not yielding to those opportunities to unload uh, the burden that comes with a Christian life, a Christian walk. The Bible here instructs us by inspiration and uh, in presenting to us a, a, uh, an exhortation to endure temptation and not, as the Bible says, err. If you'll follow along with me, beginning in verse number 12, I'd like to read the scripture. The Bible says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Our Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace once more and asking that the wonderful Spirit of God would speak to our hearts, illuminating us to the truths of this passage, instructing, inspiring, convicting, uh, applying this message to our personal needs this morning. I pray, Father, that you will help us to endure those temptations to quit, to throw in the towel, as we say, to give up, to yield to uh, that which is forbidden by you and by your word. Oh, help us, Lord, to, to uh, be in Christians who endure temptation and not Christians who err. And so help us, I pray, uh, to live by faith in thee, that we might endure temptation. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a little child, I had a, our family had a small library, and in that library we had a series of children's books. And uh, one of those books was uh, entitled Aesop's Fables. And there were many of the fables that became favorites of mine and my little five and six and seven and eight-year-old imagination as I read uh, Aesop's fables. And they all had various instructions that were uh, beneficial in life. And I recalled when I was studying for this message on enduring, uh, persevering in temptation, not yielding to it, is continuing doing what God wants us to do with the right attitude, the right spirit, in spite of the fact that the burden is heavy. That's uh, what it means to endure, means to carry a heavy burden. And that burden being the will of God for our lives. And uh, erring then is to, is to lay down that burden. It's to decide to no longer carry the burden. And so in the very meaning of the word endurance, when he says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation. It's just a matter of just continuing on, keeping on. Now I remember reading the tortoise and the hare. The hare, let me read it for you. The hare was once boasting of his speed before the other animals. I have never yet been beaten, said he. When I put forth my full speed, I challenge anyone here to race with me. The tortoise said quietly, I accept your challenge. Oh, that is a good joke, said the hare. I could dance around you all the way. Keep your boasting till you've won, answered the tortoise. Shall we race? So a course was fixed, and a start was made. The hare darted almost out of sight at once, but soon stopped, and to show his contempt for this tortoise, lay down to have a nap. The tortoise plodded on, and plodded on, and plodded on, 
And when the hare woke up from his nap, he saw that the tortoise was just near the winning post, and he could not run up in time to save the race. Then said the tortoise, slow but steady progress wins the race. Well, I think we can even say amen to one of Aesop's fables, don't you? Well, in the scripture in front of us this morning, we're reminded by the Spirit of God of the necessity of of, uh, enduring temptation. The Bible begins with a promise. He said, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. And beloved, we need to embrace this promise from God's word, though we oftentimes in our time of temptation cannot see the promises of God. They are nevertheless yet real. They're still reliable, even though we cannot touch them. We cannot smell them. Our senses defy us. They say, oh, God has abandoned me, and there is no hope, and there is no help, and there is no reason for me to continue pressing on with the upward way. But in those moments, in those times in our Christian life, may we, by faith, embrace the promises of God's word, like the one in front of us this morning. Blessed is the man. Why, that very phrase ought to capture the attention It ought to arrest every sincere Christian who wants to experience God's best for his or her life. You see, the word blessed has encompassed within it all that you could think of of joy and rejoicing and happiness and and prosperity. And God says, blessed is the man. I wondered when uh, God inspired James to write this, if he might not have had in his mind Some of those other passages in Scripture that remind us in this same venue or the same way. For example, Psalm 1, blessed is the man, same phrase. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he... The blessed man shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Well, now here in James chapter number one, we meet another, another blessing from the Lord, a promise. Blessed is the man, he says, that endureth temptation. Will you, will I, will we believe the promises of God when we are in temptation, or will we err? I wonder if he may have thought of Psalm 32, verse 2. Blessed is the man to whom, unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. And in whose spirit there is no guile. Uh, one of my favorites is Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Maybe Psalm 84, 12 came to James' mind. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Who is this blessed man, this blessed Christian, this blessed woman? Why, my friend, it is the one who endures temptation. There is no reward. There is no blessing in quitting. It is the forfeiting of blessing. It is the forfeiting of reward to give up, to quit, to give in to the yielding and to the flesh and to the desires of the devil and of the world, the culture in which we live that in a compound way, Uh, seeks to draw us away from allegiance to Jesus Christ and obedience to his word. He said, oh, listen, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, the one that bears up under the load and does not give in, does not give up, does not quit, does not turn back, does not yield where they ought not yield. Blessed is that man. Well, what then are the blessings to that man? Well, two of them are present, one of them is future. Look with me in verse number 12. For, he says, when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So blessed is the man that endureth temptation. You know, is is a present active continuous word. What does that mean? That means that you don't have to wait until later to receive blessings from endurance. Now, I know endurance is not enjoyable, is it? Just by its very nature, the word, the word has a It makes me tired just saying the word endurance, you know? But there are blessings that come to us even while we endure. You find this in in athletics. Now, my, other than watching a ball game with popcorn and a soda in my hand, 
my athletics really take place in this little room in my house. It's called, I call it the torture ta- chamber, <laughs> where I have a recumbent bike, which isn't too bad, but I can, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that elliptical can make a mess of me. And, uh, but you know what? When you set that dial there for the time and you set the, the pressure and it's made so it increases, it goes from one to two in two minutes to three in four minutes to, and you watch that, that go. And you know, the temptation to quit is ever present. But you know, while you're, while you're still exercising, you reach a point that when you, you cross this, this kind of line, as it were. I don't really understand it. I'm sure people that are really involved in this have a better grasp of it. But I, I'm sure it's true to where you begin, even in your pain of endurance, you begin to feel a sense of satisfaction, a sense of accomplishment because I'm going to make it. And you know, the Bible says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. My friend, even in your temptation, even in that, that, uh, that painful time in your life, God has blessings for us even in that. There's a sense of personal satisfaction. With each resistance, there is a victory won. Amen. Now he goes on. And he says also that when he is tried, Now, that little phrase bears our consideration because it is also a present blessing for enduring temptation when he is tried. Now, tried needs to have a little more explanation. This very word, it's the word, uh, I'm going to tell it to you in the Greek language, it's dokimas. Uh, We get a word, we say the word document or documented or documentary, uh, (coughs) documentation. And here's what it meant. If you lived 2,000 years ago and you were that Middle Eastern culture receiving this letter inspired by God, and the Bible says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation when he is tried. The word tried means when he is receiving the approval of God. You see, if you you were a businessman uh, or had a business in their culture in their day, uh, they, they weighed on scales... They, they weighed the, uh, the money and they weighed the goods you were buying. Your scales had to be certified that your weights were correct. Your money had to be certified. What you could do, you could take a gold coin that had to weigh a certain amount and you could shave a little bit off of it. You might look at it and say, oh, it's worth. But if you were giving coins back that were not of the proper weight or your scales were, not, were, were out of balance, so you were giving less product for more money. Do you understand? It's kind of, do you remember the Norman, uh, uh, was it Rockwell or Rock, uh, who's the guy? Rockwell. Rockwell. You know the picture with the, uh, the lady's got her, her finger around the balance and so does the shop owner. Well, here, here's what they do. They would, uh, representatives from the local government would show up and they had a set of uh, weights that were, were uh, documented, documents then they would take your weights, unannounced, and then they would weigh them. And if, you're, if you were not being honest, then they removed uh, a certification from your business. And without that certification, you couldn't operate a business, or at least not a reputable business. If you weighed in, if your weights were right, you're weighed, and they came out proper, you were honest. Then they'd put a... a in your, in your business, prominent place, dokimas, uh, approved. Now here's what he's saying right now. If you're enduring a temptation, there's something you'd like to do. You'd like to quit. You'd like to go home. You'd like to do this. You'd like to do that. And you know it's not in the will of God. You know that's not God's plan for you. You are in a temptation. Obviously, the burdens that you're facing right now are just seem so heavy to you, and you just don't know, I don't know how I can do this. But you have to have faith in God, faith in God's promises that right now you are being documented, approved in heaven. In other words, when when you're discussed in heaven, and you are discussed in heaven, but when you're discussed in heaven by, by our heavenly father, you're documented because you're enduring temptation. You say, well, you mean they talk about people on earth in heaven? Sure. And, uh, the Lord loves to brag on people that are documented. What did he say to the devil one day? 
Hey, hey, you. You ever considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth. He has two at the evil. He's an extraordinarily good man. Do you know what he's saying there? He's saying Job is documented as approved. And do you know right now you've got a, you've got a reputation with him? In the window of your life, is there a dakimas? They say, yeah, you're approved right now. Now, that's, that's worth living for Christ for right there. To know that you're documented. You know, sometimes we think, you know, I'm just down here and nobody knows and nobody cares what I'm doing. No, that's not true. He knows and he cares. Those are two present blessings right now. By the way, I, I, I personally believe that the race that we're running here, that there's a measure of observation and awareness on the other side by our loved ones also. Um, you know, three of the men that were the most, had the most profound spiritual impact on my life are with the Lord. And if they have any awareness of their investment, and I think they do, so I think they're following their investment because they're reaping reward as long as I remain documented. Uh, and I, my life, even here, could be a blessing to them on the other side. But there's a future blessing mentioned here. You've got to believe it by faith. You see it in verse 12? Blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried. But now he goes to the future tense. He shall receive the crown of life. Now, this crown of life is a, uh, a wonderful recognition. It's a recognition by our Savior, the Lord Jesus, for a job well done for a service that was honorable, that was honest. Oh, it's not that we didn't make mistakes. It's not that we didn't purposely sin. But you know, we endured the Christian life and we, we did the will of God and we, we followed his plan for our lives and we served him with our lives. And one day we're going to all sit and stand at a judgment seat. I think we'll, we'll be there with our generation. I think I'll be there with you and you'll be there with me and all the folks that have been and are a part of North Love Baptist Church and our relationship together. And you know, our works are going to be tried. You know, they say, okay, Paul, how did you, how'd you do pastoring North Love Baptist Church? How'd you do in your personal relationship with Christ? How were you as a husband to Mrs. Kingsbury? And how were you as a parent to Justin and to their children? How were you as a citizen? How were you as a witness? See? How, how did you do with all the talents and abilities and opportunities that Christ gave to you? Well, you know... If the Christian that endures temptation, when they get to the other side, the Bible says the Lord Jesus will reward them with a crown of life. Now I want to tell you, you'll stand, you'll stand tall when you hear these words if you endure temptation. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now you've got a choice to make this morning, and well, you're making it. If you don't endure, if you quit, you give up, give in throw in the towel, you just go, your, you yield, you yield to temptation. It's something, uh, uh, you know, you know it's not God's best for you. You know it's not his will. It's a temptation. You say, man, but it'll be easier, but I'd like to, all right, you yield. Here's what you do. But you're forfeiting future blessing. And if you do that often enough, you could forfeit a lot of future blessing and a lot of blessings that the Lord has for you now. So when we err and we do not endure, we need to come back once again to this promise from God by faith that we find here in this verse. Now then, number two. The Bible here teaches us in verse number 12. Which the Lord hath promised, verse, end of the verse, to them that love him. Now, this is the same sentence. In other words, he says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. So this individual, this Christian individual, they endure temptation. They, they're, they're there, they, the, the devil puts it there, the flesh puts it there, the world in which we live, the culture. He says, don't follow Christ. Don't bear those burdens, go your own way. But then here's what he says at the end of the verse. He says, now you're going to receive a crown of life for enduring temptation. And then, same sentence, 
And he says, which the Lord hath promised to everybody, everybody who loves him, speaking of Jesus. So there's a connection between loving Jesus and enduring temptation. Do you see it? Same sentence. So here's what we must believe by faith, beloved. We must believe that endurance is made possible by loving Jesus Christ. This is, in my mind, the most important issue that we'll discuss in these few minutes together. The only way to stay in the will of God in our lives, to endure temptation, is through a personal, loving relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, you're just not going to get it because you say, well, I'm just, uh, you know, nothing to it but to do it, and and uh, some self-help and all those things that may be beneficial here and there in life. But in the big scheme of our lives, the reason why most Christians do not endure, endure and still, instead they err. They go away from the will of God. The burdens get too heavy. The lure of sin becomes so strong and they yield unto it. We'll talk about that in a minute. But those who endure temptation are inevitably those who have a love relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, that's not easy itself either. So many things that are playing for our time and for our lives, are there not? For us to take time to be holy, to speak off with our Lord. Other things come in that make it difficult to spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. To make much of God's children to help those who are weak. You see, the Christian life, except we develop and maintain a personal walk with the Lord, it would be impossible for us to maintain an endurance against the temptations and the temptations that we face. This is so foundational to your life and to mine. If you don't have a plan, get a plan. If you don't have a means by which you can do it, get in the Bible. Find a subject. Find the subject that is the most challenging to you. In fact, I found in my Christian walk that when I'm engaged in a temptation, uh, to endure that temptation, if I'll turn to the Lord and I'll turn to his word and I'll I'll seek answers from the Bible and insight from the Bible by dissecting, by defining, by taking that passage of scripture apart and each word apart, by seeing where it's used in other places in the Bible, God then illuminates my mind. And you know what? It it always increases my, my love relationship with the Lord and gives me then the stamina that I need to endure the temptation. Now, there's not a person here, and your pastor included, that has not erred. And you know, there's always a connection between erring, in other words, yielding to that temptation, and forsaking the will of God for my life. There's always a connection between that and my personal walk with the Lord. So that's number two. By faith, believe that that time you spend with the Lord in his word, on your knees, praying, studying his word, seeking his help, it will help you to endure temptation. It surely will, according to our passage. Now then, the next fact uh, that I want you to uh, notice with me here that we've got to believe if we're going to endure temptation is in verse number 13. There's something we must never say. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted. Uh, With evil, neither tempteth he any man. You see, here's the fact. God will never tempt me to sin, but he will allow me to be tempted. Now, there's a tendency when we're in temptation to say, you know what? Well, if you didn't want me to sin, why did you allow that to come into my life? Kind of like Adam and Eve in the garden. They get caught with, you know, fruit in 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 their stomach and yeah, well, if you wouldn't have put a tree here, and if you wouldn't have made the devil, we wouldn't even be it. You can't blame God. Don't place blame on him. You say, well, then, what in the world is the purpose? Well, God does have a purpose in temptation. See? Now, we've talked about it earlier in the book of James, but it's, it's mentioned here once again. You know, God allows you and me to be tempted because he has purposes to accomplish in our lives to grow us, to mature us, also to give us ministry opportunity. I think of this man in the Bible in Genesis chapter number 50, Joseph. Now, Joseph endured a lot of temptation, didn't he? Boy, he was favored by his father, forsaken by his brothers, 
falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He was forgotten about when he was in prison. He had ample opportunity, didn't he, to just to throw in the towel and say, man, alive, this kind of, this kind of life, I don't want to live it anymore. But he endured temptation. And at the end of his life, or at the end of uh, the book of Genesis, you find out his mindset. Here was his thinking by faith. His brothers, they had just buried their dad, and his brothers, they all come back from, uh, from Canaan, where they buried their father. And they get back and they say, you know what, Joe's going to, he's going to exact punishment on us now. Joseph's going to kill us. Now the daddy's gone. And so they concoct a lie, and these guys were always scheming. And you know, Joseph saw it. And here in Genesis 50, here's what he says to his brothers, verse 20. He said, you know, fellas, he said, you, you did mean to do me evil. That was your intention. But he said, you know what? But God meant it for good. <laughs> and he said, you know, you're, you, were, you, were really, you were really trying to ruin my life. But you know, God allowed it not to ruin my life. He said, God used it to save our family from starvation. And ultimately to bring the Savior to the world. And you know, every temptation, when we're enduring a temptation, it is an opportunity that God is allowing us to experience that we might grow spiritually, that we might glorify him, and that we might expand the outreach of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Finally, number four. The next two verses are so instructive in taking us to the very core of an example of how this matter of temptation, how it works on us. When he says in verse 14, that every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. Now, when we think of lust, we immediately think, oh, that's a bad word, but it's really not a bad word. It means appetite. It means desire. And it's even used of the Spirit of God. In one occasion, we said the Spirit of the Lord lusteth to the point or to envy. So it's a strong desire. Now, do you know God made us with desires? He made us with appetites. And then he gave us parameters for the, for the fulfillment of those appetites and uh, a right way to fulfill all of those appetites. Do you know, but here's a temptation that comes in. It says, do you know what? You don't need to live by God's rules and God's standards. Instead, you can just indulge and, in this temptation and you'll feel so much better. Life will be so much easier. But what's happening really is this person, as he says here, he is being drawn away of his own lust. In other words, he's taking a desire, a desire is there, but the devil or the world or their own flesh or a combination of two or more of those, they're pulling that individual. They're pulling that person. You know what I mean? Sure you do. That you, you're there, you, you've been there, you'll be there. I've been there already today. Probably so have you. And there's a desire. Think about whatever it may be. And there's an, he calls it next, he says, and enticed. In other words, you notice that it's appealing. You know the word entice, it's really the bait that covers the hook. It's the trap. Now, if you look at, if, you, if, you're, if you're being enticed by temptation, you've got to look beyond the bait to the hook that will eventually catch you and ruin you. That's what he's saying. Now, 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 listen to this. This person has not, yet, has not yet sinned until verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived. In other words, if I yield to that enticement, if I do not turn away and I yield to it, then suddenly I give birth to sin in my life. That's what the word conceived means. And this is the only kind of abortion that is acceptable with God. In fact, highly recommended. That once a seed of temptation is planted in our hearts and we yield to it, and that sin is just there in our heart, he says, abort that that has been conceived in your heart. Get back into the position. Because when that takes place, it bringeth forth, here's what he said, sin. 
And sin is always easier to deal with today than it will be tomorrow. Because it will grow. It starts as a little seed when it's conceived. And then it'll grow, and it'll grow, and it'll grow, and it'll grow. And it'll become, it'll become progressively more difficult to resist and to deal with and to refuse. And so it is by faith you and I must learn from the example given to us here in Scripture that when we are tempted, not if we're tempted, but when we are tempted, when our, when our lusts are drawing us away from the will of God for our lives, it is then and it is there that we must run back, we must turn back to whom? To our Savior, the Lord Jesus, in whom we have a love relationship for his assistance that we might not yield to the temptation, but rather that we might endure. So there it is. That's how faith works in endurance. And the Christian life, no matter who you are, Christian life is rife with temptation. Sometimes in the ministry, uh, if the secretaries see that I've got this particular book in my hands, if I've got this book out, they know, boy, pastor must be under a lot of stress. Years ago, I came across the testimony of, of a remarkable man born... February 15, 1874 in Kilkea, Ireland, the oldest son of a family of 10 children, seven sons, three daughters. His dad was a doctor. Their family moved, though, to London in Ernest's early years. And Ernest Shackleton did not do well in school. But Ernest Shackleton, uh, at 16, his father said, well, you're not going to do any more in school. He just loved the sea, loved the ocean. So he said, go ahead and and so he got a job on a merchant ship. And it wasn't long that his skills and leadership came into play. And, and uh, he rapidly advanced in that business, in that trade, even to the point where he had the opportunity of meeting Mr. Walter Scott. And Walter Scott, you remember, took a ship, the Discovery, on a Geographical Society-sponsored ex uh, expedition to Antarctica. And remarkably, they walked to the location of the South Pole, just a small band of men. They nearly starved, but they walked there. In fact, during that, they had sled dogs with them. Uh, they had all, all 22 sled dogs died. They ate them, actually, and, and in order for those men to survive this. Well, Ernest Shackleton was on that trip. He came back, and he had an idea. He said, I, I want to take a ship into the South Pole. I want to walk all the way across and take that ship all the way across. 1,800 miles. No human being that we know of had ever done that before. So in 1914, on the cusp of World War I, uh, Ernest Shackleton and 27 men aboard a ship that he had raised money to buy, they made for the South Pole. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that very winter, their, their boat was caught in a giant ice floe and eventually crushed a year later, November 21, 1915, they were on that ship in that crushing ice for over a year. But that didn't end there. Shackleton and his companions, they had three lifeboats and they had some food. And so they were on an ice floe. And so they got under that small ice floe and that's where they stayed, hoping that it would bring them to an inhabited island somewhere. It's all in this book, The Endurance. But you know, after many months at sea, the ice floe began to break up. And when it came apart, they had by necessity to get into those boats. And they uh, made for land. Fifteen days later, they came to a place. It's called Elephant Island. Barren, abandoned, just a frozen piece of ground in a desolate place in the southern hemisphere. At that time, when they landed on Elephant Island, it had been 497 days since they had set foot on land. He and his company... Uh, there were 250 miles between those men, their boats, and where they knew was a whaling port. So Shackleton and five men set out on one of those boats, and he promised those other men, those 21, 22 other men, he said, I will return for you. And they left. Four weeks later, they, uh, they landed on, a, on an island, and uh, when they got there, they, uh, it was called South George Island. They were on the wrong side of the island. Massive mountain, snow-capped mountain between them. The only tools they had for mountain climbing, they had, they had a rope 
they had a claw hammer. And those men, with a rope and a claw hammer, 36 hours, they climbed that mountain to get to the other side of that port. No one, had, no one believed that they would even be alive. So there he is, and uh, he got another ship. And he went back. It took two years. But in two years, he returned, and all of those men were still alive. And they all survived. Now, you know, I thought about that. By the way, he named his ship the Endurance. The reason why he named his ship the Endurance was because that from birth, in that physician's family, all ten of those children, he said that his parents made them memorize two words in Latin. They opened every day with those two words. Fortitudis vincimus. They closed, they concluded every night with those two words, fortitudis vincimus. By endurance, we conquer. And he did. But think about it. He did this for the applause of men. He did this for the honors that would come to him and to those that accompanied him. He risked his life. I'm sure he had a heart for those men, a sincere heart for those men. But he endured all of these hardships, probably for, for some silver, some, for some gold, for some money in the bank. How much more important is it that we endure the, the will of God for our lives that has meaning and purpose and reward that far exceeds this world and it stretches out into eternity? If, if Ernest Shackleton and 27 men can have that kind of determination to endure for <laughs> applause and praise and honor and money, if they can do that for that, can we not, can we not endure temptation for that which will count forever in eternity? I've grown... Very fond of this little book. It's helped me on numerous occasions to endure when I wanted to err. And I trust it'll help you today.